when do we learn how to cultivate healthy self-confidence or how to get out and stay out of the red zone? And yet these are the biggest predictors of success, regardless of how you define success. It may be financially, it may be um, emotionally feeling happy, it may be relationships. It's these non-tangibles kind of yeah. that um, that really predicts success. When your inner light shines brighter than your inner critic, success becomes inevitable, says today's Ask an Expert. Hi, I'm Joshua Carlson, co-founder of Propella Media, and today I sit down with Dr. E, as in Elizabeth Lombardo. If the name sounds familiar, it's because she's been on countless television shows and she has spoken around the world. She gives us awareness techniques and corrective techniques that we can use inside our own brain to optimize performance professionally and personally. Now let's hear what Dr. E has to say. Dr. E, thank you so much for coming on our Ask an Expert podcast. Thanks for having me. It's an honor. All right. So I'm big on Genesis stories. I like hearing how, you know, the inspiration was born. And for you, from what I've been able to glean, you had this moment while you were working in a VA hospital with a patient. Um, but it also sounds like you had a Mitzi moment very early in your life as well. So I'd love to just hear you uh, share with the audience about those periods in your life. Wow, a Mitzi moment. So Mitzi is my inner critic. I have named her because we all have an inner critic, that little voice inside of us that says not so kind things. Um, she controlled my life for a while, but luckily she doesn't anymore. And we could talk about how we can control our, our inner critic. So I, I'll start, I'm not sure which Mitzi story was. So I'll start with the VA story. So I was a, I got out of college. I went to physical therapy school. I loved being a physical therapist. Greatest job, right? I help people get out of pain and help them walk again after a stroke. And really, I thought this was, this was it. And then my life completely changed one day. I had a client who we'll call David and David was a, um, a gentleman who had had a surgical amputation because of diabetic complications. Okay. Unfortunately, not uncommon. He was sent down to the physical therapy gym and it was my job to teach him how to walk again and use this prosthetic device. And, you know, I'm enthusiastic now, but when I was in my twenties, I was really enthusiastic. And so I was, you know, cheering him on and he, he wanted absolutely nothing to do with me. And he yelled at me and he said, just leave me alone. Wanted to go back to his room. So I sent him back to his room and later we were doing rounds with the doctors and the nurses and the therapists where we all talk about each client and how we can best serve them as a team. Everyone agreed that David was struggling. <laughs> what happened next was what changed my life, however. The attending physician, right, the surgeon who had literally cut off David's leg the day before, said, I'll prescribe him Prozac. Now, there's a time and place for medication, absolutely. But it just struck me, why are we not talking to this guy, right? Why are we not helping him process this loss that he is he's dealing with? Right. And it was... Um, I, I say, and truly, it was almost like the heavens opened up and said, Elizabeth, this is your true calling to go back and help people like David. And of course, we don't all lose limbs, but we all deal with loss. <laughs> Hello, pandemic. We all deal with disappointment. We all deal with having dreams that don't necessarily come to fruition and how to help people process really whatever life throws at them so that they can move forward. I realized was my mission in life. And so I went back to school, um, thought it'd be a couple of years, but apparently <laughs> it takes a little bit longer to get a PhD. And I remember the first week in school, madly taking notes as my professor was writing and something hit me. Why do I have to get a PhD in order to learn this? Because we would all benefit from better understanding just basic concepts of how our thoughts impact our lives and how to control what goes on up here so that we can change what goes on up there. And so that really became my mission, not only to help people, but to do it in a way, I say in bite-sized digestible morsels, right? So, yeah. so one thing that we can use and we can apply in our life, it doesn't have to be this whole long, I'm changing my entire life, but what's one small change that we can make in our lives to really make a pivotal shift so that our life becomes even better. So well said, and it's a, it's a beautiful inspirational story to me, you know, seeing, going in to a profession where you can physically help people, but realizing, you know, the body follows the brain, right? And so you go back and speaking of body following the brain, I guess the Mitzi moment is very early, this inner critic that you have. Um, maybe it's not a defining moment, but to me, it was profound as I come across that you realize at a pretty young age, I have this inner critic that, you know, by all accounts, is hindering me. 
And yeah. at an early age to be able to realize that and then do something about it to me is um, it's impressive. And and so, <laughs> you know, that's that's the Mitzi yeah. moment that I was uh, that I was referring to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I think especially I, I, I have a one of my companies is working with teenagers. And so I think teenagers and adolescents that that inner critic can take over even more so, but realizing it's just what we're saying to ourselves. It doesn't make it reality. It's just what we're saying to ourselves. And we get to, we can't always change what goes on out here, but we can always change what we're saying to ourselves. And when we change that inner dialogue, truly everything else changes. Okay. Um, so you've already just teased a little bit about my next question, which is, you're in the business of helping people and it's a very practical business of you know traditional therapy but you have this epiphany that there's a business out there to help others that don't necessarily have the time or the money to go to school to get that phd when do you realize like hey there's a business model out there that's that's ripe for the taking so right after I got my degree, I um, I had a private practice, traditional, had, I had the couch and everything. And um, we were living in Dallas, Texas. And then my husband took a job in Pennsylvania. So this was like, I mean, practically prehistoric ages, right? So this was before the internet. This was before therapists did any kind of, you know, telehealth or anything like that. So I, I said goodbye to all of my clients and I felt guilty i mean you know my clients were coming to see me for fear of abandonment issues and i'm abandoning and them leaving. right yeah, so yeah. i said to myself i'm i'm you know i'm never doing that again i'm gonna write a book i'm gonna write a book because instead of one-on-one -on -one, then i can write a book and hopefully help the masses and so i wrote a book on happiness i had a <laughs> i had another experience with another gentleman who didn't have all of his appendages and um and that caused me to kind of realize what is happiness and how can we figure this out? This was way before positive psychology was that was a thing. Yeah. Um, and so I wrote, I, I was writing this book, which is now entitled a happy you, your ultimate prescription for happiness. And as I was writing it, I learned a statistic, which is that the average book sells less than 250 copies its first year. Okay. And given I was going to have my husband and my mother buy at least several dozen, I was thinking to myself, I've, I've got to get this message out there, right? I, ha I have to have a platform. That's what we call it. Um, the problem was I was scared to death to speak to a group bigger than three people. Okay. So I had to really overcome because I decided I'm going to become a professional speaker. I'm going to start doing media and being on TV. And the thought of it excited me. And it also scared the absolute heck out of me. <laughs> so talk about your inner critic creeping in. I had to do a lot of work on myself internally, yeah. as well as skills wise externally to be able to do that. Um, and that's when I realized not only that this was a good business model, but it's really fun. Every day is different. I get to do podcasts with you. I just got off um, two different client calls. Right after this, I have a, um, a conversation with someone. I'm giving a, a speech to about 3,000 people in, in September. So we're doing our pre-call for that. So it's really, it's, it's, it's so fun, but I had to overcome myself and my inner obstacles in order to get here. So let's talk about that because I imagine Mitzi was chirping quite aggressively. Ooh, when you're yeah. at the doorstep of starting a business, Mitzi's just she's she's not sleeping. She's keeping yeah. you busy. So and isn't it, it? It isn't like a it's like a tug of war though in your brain, right? Because yeah. part of you's like, oh my gosh, it's going to be so great. I'm going to change the world. And then the other part of me is like, who are you? You don't know what you're doing. You're totally going to mess up. And so it was really this um, civil war that was going on inside of me. Part, part of it was addressing that inner critic and realizing this is what you're saying to yourself. It's not reality. Another part of it was really, I mean, I did a lot of training on uh, media. So I, I, you know, I've, I've been on a lot of TV shows and I've been on a lot of stages. I did a lot of training to help enhance my skills on that. And so as I became more competent, I became more confident also. Okay. All right. Um, well, you mentioned a book. You've written another book uh, about the red zone, and I would like you to share with our audience. Uh, oh, oh just, wait. Just happens to be sitting on the desk. <laughs> well, it's conveniently uh, positioned. Um, talk to us about the red zone, what yeah. it is, and how we should use this as a tool to improve uh, our everyday life. 
Yeah. So the psychological red zone, different from the football red zone, the psychological red zone, we want to get out of football red zone. You want to get into, uh, but the psychological red zone happens when we experience high levels of stress or what in psychology we call distress. Distress is the negative aspect of stress. Okay. Stress can actually be positive, right? When we're excited sure. about doing something. Um, and it grew out of a question that I had partly about myself and also okay. about others. But the question was this, why do good people sometimes do bad things? Why do good people sometimes do bad things? I mean, if I look back at my, my 51 years, coming up on 52 years of life, um, you know, there's some, there's some events where I'm like, mm, not too proud of that, right? And we, we all have that. Sure. So, but I think of myself overall as a good person. So like there was some cognitive dissonance there, right? If I'm a good person, why would I do do Not some things thing. that aren't so yeah. great. And that's really where the red zone came up because what happens is when we experience high levels of stress and the red zone, if you think of distress as being from zero, no distress at all, right? No yeah. negative emotion at all to 10 out of 10, the most distressed you've ever been. And distress could be anger or sadness or anxiety or fear or worry. Again, any emotion you don't want. Sure. It goes on this continuum and the red zone happens when we're at a seven out of 10 or higher. So a seven and eight and nine or a 10, that's the psychological red zone. And in the red zone, biologically, what happens is we actually think differently than when we're in the green zone. So just think for a moment, like in the past week, what has been your average level of distress from zero to 10, you think? Hmm, I'm going to go three and a half. Excellent. So nice and low. I would call yep. that the green zone. Um, so in the green zone, we're using more of our frontal lobe, right? That structure that differentiates us from other animals. Yeah. It allows us to engage in executive functioning, right? Problem solving, perspective taking. When we're in the green zone, we can see the good and the not so good. Yeah. This is where resilience happens. You know, yes, times are tough and I know I can handle this. This is where perspective taking happens, right? Yeah, Here's right. my belief. That's your belief. Great. Let's talk about this. So we're very open. We can see all different perspectives. We can say as a business owners, we can say, yes, you know, maybe things aren't going as well as I want them to. And I know, uh, you know, growth mindset, I can, I can keep working. I can keep learning. I can keep getting better. Now, as we go up in this distress scale, instead of seeing the good and the bad, we start to focus more exclusively on the negatives so that when we get into the red zone, that seven, that eight, that nine, that 10, we are focused almost exclusively on the negatives. We call it negative filtering in psychology. What's wrong as opposed to what's also right. Yeah, right. And there's a biological reason for this because in the red zone, our limbic system basically hijacks our rational thinking. And if we think about limbic system, that's the fight or flight mechanism. Yeah. And this made sense evolutionarily, right? If our cave ancestors heard a rustling in the bush and thought, nah, it's nothing, <laughs> They may not live another day, right? Yeah, right Instead, right. they went into the red zone, focus on the problem, negative filtering, focus on the problem, get rid of the animal, get away from the animal. Once the animal's gone, ah, out of the red zone, they go, right? Yeah. The problem is our brain still functions like that. And yet our sources of stress aren't as short term. Mm -hmm. right? Hello, pandemic, right? Or a business or a relationship problem or a loved one who's struggling with health issues, right? They tend to be more long-term. And there are a lot of people right now who are basically stuck in the red zone without okay. even realizing it. So they aren't thinking 100% rationally. They aren't acting 100% rationally. They're only focusing on what's wrong. And that creates all kinds of problems in our professional lives and our personal lives. So without saying, go out, buy the book, which everybody should, what are some techniques that we can do to first, I guess, be self-aware, right? And, you know, I obviously, you know, it's, it's harder for us to look internally and see that. So there's probably cues from other people, but how do we become aware and what do we do with that awareness to get ourselves out of that red zone? Because these stresses that you talk about are long-term issues. Yeah. Yeah. And so I call these red flags. These are indicators that mm, you might be in the red zone. One is emotions that you don't want. Mm -hmm. Ask yourself on a scale from zero to 10, what is my level of distress? In fact, I actually have some clients who have trouble be being aware of being in the red zone because maybe you've had this experience, but it's not uncommon where, you know, you're kind of going through your day and suddenly you'll lose it, right? And you lose it because you're in the red zone. You didn't even realize you were getting up into that red zone. And then one little thing happens, the straw that broke the camel's back, right? And yeah. boom, eruption. So starting to be aware of your emotions and where you are in this distress scale. So for some people, I recommend that you actually have a pop-up in your phone that comes up. Where are you right now? 
where are you right now? So that you start to become aware of the signs, and we'll talk a little bit more about what those signs are, of when you're getting close to the red zone or when you're actually in the red zone. Okay. So one of the red flags is emotions you don't want. When you notice yourself feeling intense, Angst. we call it, they're not really negative emotions because all emotions are helpful, but yeah. intense emotions that you don't want. Second red flag is physical sensations. Right? Where does stress go in your body? For some people, it's their their stomach. For some people, it's headaches. I remember I was walking, I was um, working on my dissertation and I walked by the mirror and this is how I looked. <laughs> like my ears and my shoulders yeah. have become one because right. for me, my red zoneness goes right it's in my neck. in the neck, yeah. Yeah, so for me, when I, when I start to massage my neck, you know, kind of w- without being aware of it, oh, yeah. w- where am I right now on this scale? So physical sensations you don't want. And then the third one are behaviors you don't want. Okay. Um, so when we're in the red zone, sometimes we can be a little less pleasant, a little more irritable. Um, red zone also can be, for example, procrastination happens a lot in the red zone. The thinking being, oh, it's so awful and unbearable. I'm not even going to do it, even if it's something yeah. important. So looking at your behaviors, are you doing something you don't want to do? Or are you not doing something that you want to do? Are you consistently late with your projects, for example? That could be because you're in the red zone. And so using those signs to ask yourself, where am I on this distress scale? And you want to, once you notice yourself creeping up, I'd say at a five or a six, stop and do something healthy and helpful to get it lower. Because once you cross the threshold of the red zone, the way we approach reducing those symptoms and that distress needs to be different because we go from thinking rationally. So if we're at a five or six, we can use our brains to wait a minute. It. Yeah, to, to rationalize it. Wait a minute. I know I'm I'm only focusing on what's wrong, but but let's talk about what's right. Sure. Let me be mindful right now. Let me do some deep breathing. All of that can work when we're not in the red zone. When we cross the threshold of the red zone, because we think differently, we actually want to have a whole different repertoire of 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 bags of a bag of tricks of what to do to get lower that you can't, because you can't rationalize it out. So I'll give a great example. Um, I have, I've had a coaching client and we were talking about gratitude. Now gratitude sounds, oh, is that lovely? But brain scans show that when people experience gratitude, the stress center in their brain actually reduces activity. So it's a really powerful way to have less distress, yeah. to be more empowered, to be more positive. She, she was interacting with a colleague who, another thing to be aware of is what your triggers are. We can talk about that. But one of her triggers was this colleague of hers. She just like seeing him put her right in the red zone. So she's having this conversation with him and he's being all passive aggressive. And she said, and my coaching clients always say this, I I could hear your meaning my voice saying, just practice gratitude, focus on, on, on being grateful. And she said, but I didn't want to. (laughs) That's red zone thinking, right? Because yeah. think about it. If you're if you're in the red zone, your brain, your subconscious basically feels like it's drowning. Right. If you were drowning and flailing around and screaming, you're not going to focus on gratitude, right? You're going right. to focus on not dying because that's what our brain is doing. So gratitude is a great thing to do to help us stay out of the red zone and be in the green zone. Mm. But it probably doesn't work when you're already in that past the threshold of the red zone. So being aware of triggers, um, I think that's a good one. And I think we've all had that colleague at least once or twice in our career. Um, What are other triggers? (laughs) If so, send this to them. Um, (laughs) Yeah, and realize that a trigger is only a trigger if we let it be a trigger. Okay, right. A trigger is only a trigger if we let it be a trigger. What do I mean? Because it's not the event. It's not the experience. It's not the person. It's what we say to ourselves about them. So I was mentioning this um, this other client I had who who had also was an amputee. Um, so uh, there's this gentleman named Roger. When I was doing my my postdoctoral training, I worked at a major trauma center, and Roger was an electrician. Um, and one day I received a consult from for Roger. He had been working on a wire that was supposed to be inactive. Unfortunately, it was quite active. And so when he touched the wire, a bolt of current went through his body and burned him so severely that the doctor gave his wife the following option. We can let him die or we can try to save his life by surgically amputating both of his arms. Wow. So it was my job as the psychologist to go in and basically help him get out of the red zone, right? And when I went in to meet Roger, no arms, sitting there, had a big smile on his face. What's going on, Roger? And Roger told me, 
He said, I am so grateful that I'm still alive. Mm -hmm. And I truly believe that my life was saved and I'm still here on this earth for a very important reason. I don't know what it is, but I'm really excited to figure it out. Right. That's that's total green zone thinking. But I assure you, it was not surgically amputating both of his arms that caused him to feel so happy and grateful, right? Yeah. So it's not the events per se, it's what we say to ourselves about them. And that's actually a beautiful thing because we can't control everything that goes on out here, but we always get to control what we're saying to ourselves. So when you find a trigger, if there's a person who just annoys you or a situation that you a procrastinate or just causes you to go in the red zone, Use that as an opportunity to say, ah, it's not the event. It's not the person. It's what I'm saying to myself. And we can change what we're saying to ourselves so it works for us instead of against us. It's the power that we give it, right? Or it the really power is. that we can take away. And it sounds like Roger, I mean, what a dream patient to have, right? You know, I mean, he's already hit the ground running for you. Um, let's oh. talk about business. Oh, I did not oh, help him at all. Yeah, he helped me. Right, I followed right. him for a while. I was, it was my postdoctoral training, so it, no one paid for me, right? So I, I was able to spend some time with him without having to charge him. He was the reason why I wrote a book on happiness, because I thought, if this guy could be this happy, yeah, can't we all? And right. so, yeah, that became my mission. Well, thank you, Roger. Um, it's yeah. it's not just inspiration. I think it's it's kind of a lifestyle, which I feel is a lot of what you're talking about here. It's it's ways for us to consciously try to rewire our approach to things, um, which I feel this is, you know, obviously business podcasts. Let's talk about business because I feel like the C level, right? The the heart of the business that is you know driving all of these different activities from finance to marketing to HR. These are generally speaking, very high performers, very, you know, type A. What are instances you see when you walk into an organization to, to, to help, right? To, to bring some, um, some clarity, better approaches to things. What are things that you see businesses being, um, I guess, reticent, like they, they just, they're not willing to open up to this outsider. Like, how do you break through to, to, to get somebody to say, Hey, it's not a bad thing. It's just a thing and we can make it better. Yeah. I mean, we all get into the red zone, right? Um, so one of the things, uh, so here's, we know that mental health is a huge issue right now. We know that stress levels are at an all time high and a lot of, as you said, type a individuals, they thrive on stress. Yeah. So we're not saying get rid of stress. In fact, the, the title of my book is, is called uh, Transform Your Stress to uh, for Optimal True, Transform Your Stress to Optimize True Success. So we want to take the energy that you have and use it for good as opposed to evil. Um, and just realizing how does being in the red zone impact organizations? Well, we know, for example, that it costs U.S. companies over $300 billion annually on things like absenteeism, right? Presenteeism, when your employees are there, but they're not really there. Yeah. Healthcare utilization, turnover, which is a huge issue right now. Where I see the red zone as being so helpful is with all these, you know, the stress and the mental health. It gives, first of all, it gives us a language that destigmatizes and depathologizes mental health. I mean, we all have physical health because we have a body. We all have mental health because we have a mind. And yet there's something about the term mental health that can be scary. So it gives us a way to communicate and, and an easy way to communicate. I just, just before this podcast, I, I received an email from, um, I, I spoke at an event. Um, it was maybe 250 executives on the red zone and how does it impact you and what can you do to help yourself as well as your team? And, and the person who emailed me was saying how, the concept of I'm in the red zone right now. I need to get out of the red zone right now. That person's in the red zone right now. How can I help my team get out of the red zone? It's so it's so sticky and it's so um, applicable for so many of us without us feeling like, oh, there's something wrong with me. So we're simply acknowledging where we are. I gave a, a talk um, a couple months ago, and about a week later, I got to meet with the, uh, the the executive team, and I love doing that. You know what what resonated with you, what works, what yeah. didn't work, and the CFO of this company told me after understanding what the red zone is and understanding that a red zone brain can't focus, problem solve, you know, isn't effective at at work. She before every meeting asks each individual, including herself, "Where are you on the distress scale from zero to ten? 
She was supposed to meet with her financial analyst. They were going to go over projections for the next year. She said he was at a nine out of 10. She said, I knew he'd be no good to me at a nine out of 10. So she rescheduled the meeting. She got him a gift certificate to Grubhub. They met the next morning when he was out of the red zone and they had an incredibly productive meeting. What's the message she's sending, not just to this individual, but the entire company? You matter, right? Our business is important and so are you. And there are certain things that we can do to make sure that we are still moving forward with our business and being successful and profitable while still addressing you as an individual. That's pretty powerful. So how do you shake? I mean, so I think it is very powerful. And I love this dichotomy that you talk about. Like we have physical health because we have bodies and we have mental health because we have brains. So I do feel like because we can't see it per se, and maybe that's it, right? We physically see our arms moving. I'm walking. I, I, I It's much more visceral when we talk about physical um, physicality. But when we're talking about mental, it feels a little willy nilly in some environments, the conversation itself. So what do you do to that firm to really get them? um, Because I get it, right? $300 billion is a tremendous amount of money. That was pre-pandemic. Yeah, right. So (laughs) double or triple. Imagine what it is now. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you get somebody to... I guess speak their business to understand this red zone. Cause I do feel like some, I, I've worked for a few, some business leaders are like, you know, I, just go sell, <laughs> right? I mean, there's yeah. just, there's no appreciation for it. So what are techniques we can do to break those type of leaders and organizations? So I wanna, I'm going to answer that, but I just wanna go back to what we're talking about physical health versus mental health. If, if someone hears the, the term physical health a lot of times what comes up in their mind are things like diet and exercise, yeah. right? Getting sleep that they need. We think more about like, how can we be physically healthier when we hear physical health? Yeah. When we hear mental health, we tend to go right to pathology. Mental health is depression, it's anxiety, it's schizophrenia. Right. And so for some reason, we we automatically pathologize or make negative this concept of of. of of mental well-being or mental health. So how can you help leaders realize the importance of this? Simply look at the research, right? People who are in the green zone, happy people, Harvard research shows they are 31% more productive and they have an increase in sales by 38%. If every single person on your team had an increase in productivity by 31% and an increase in sales by 38% without having to pay them more, would that be beneficial to you? Like it, right? it's, it's just science, right? Yeah. Just because we it's can't data. see it doesn't make it real. So, so really looking at it, this is, this is exactly what the science says. And so when we can do some kind of even just small things, you know, those bite-sized morsels to help people spend more time in the green zone, it's going to help with profitability. I mean, you know, I, I could share a gazillion statistics on the engagement that it helps, but it really changes the entire culture and the entire company. So looking at the science is going to help yeah. these leaders realize I got that. And also think about how how do you function when you are in the red zone? So one, again, our brains don't function as well. We can't focus. We can't concentrate. There's a structure in our brain called the hippocampus. It's in charge of certain memories. Okay. And brain scans show that when people are in the red zone for a prolonged period of time, the hippocampus literally shrinks in size. Mm. So if you've ever had what you thought was a, a senior moment, Right. You go into a room and you're like, I forgot why I came in or you just had your cell phone and now it is nowhere to be found. A lot of times as we get older, we may think that's a senior moment. It's probably a red zone moment. Uh So a red zone brain is not an effective brain. A red zone brain person tends to be more irritable or passive aggressive. Uh, Those are not people who can sell well. Yeah. The other thing to think about, especially when it comes to sales, is we know that emotion sells. And it's not really what people are saying. It's the feel that they give. Whether you want to admit it or not, there are certain people who you're like, I just want to hang out with that person. They don't have to say anything. Yeah. And our energy is very much impacted by where we are on, on this distress scale. Well, you've got a technique that I've heard um, that's helpful, acronym, HELM. Uh, could you share with the audience about that? Yeah. So we were saying before how once you cross the threshold into the red zone, we need a whole different bag of tricks of how to help yourself as opposed to if you're not there. So I came up, I love acronyms, kind of weird like that. But so I came up with this um, called the helm principle, because when you're in the red zone, a seven, eight, nine, 10 on distress, you want to grab distress by the helm. So helm stands for the following. H is halt. And by halt, I mean, stop all movement in this region of your body, in your mouth, right? When you are in the red zone, don't let anything out of your mouth because that's when we say things we later regret, 
Right. And don't put anything in your mouth because that tends to be when we consume things we later regret. Um, e stands for exercise. And when I say exercise, I don't mean you got to go to the gym for an hour and a half. I mean, move your body in any way for a couple of minutes, right. a couple of minutes of push-ups, sit-ups, squats, uh, going for a brisk walk, jumping on the bed, running up a flight of stairs. What it does is it releases biochemicals in our body in our brain so that we get out of the red zone. And in fact, sometimes when I'm um, working with, with uh, coaching clients or even when I'm speaking, I'll have people stand up and do even a minute of push-ups, sit-ups, squats, jumping jacks. And it really is incredible. 60 seconds, you think, how's that going to change everything? It just gets you to cross the threshold and then you can start to see things more clearly. So that's E, exercise. L is laugh. Okay. Laughter. We know it's the best medicine. Um, you know, when we, the other day, my teenager was being very teenagery. And so instead of interacting with her, because I knew I was not going to be a good leader for my teen when I'm being annoyed with her because I'm in the red zone, I excused myself. I came right here into my home office, hopped on YouTube and watched a couple SNL skits. Does that change everything? No, but it changed my perspective. So then I could be more empathetic. Then I could be more uh, rational and problem solving as I'm dealing with the situation. So L is laugh. And then M is music of the helm principle. I'm sure you've heard a song you haven't heard in years, even decades, and it brought you right back to that time, yeah. right? Music can have such a powerful impact on our emotions. And so I recommend that people have a get out of the red zone playlist on their phone. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to think what song would I like right now? Have a playlist of songs that bring you back to a happier time. You like the beat, you like the lyrics, whatever. Listen to the song, dance around. You get two aspects of the Helm Principle. Again, it's not that it's going to change everything, but it's going to change you being in the red zone. And once you get out of the red zone, that's when you can think more rationally. That's when you can start to act more rationally. Okay. Uh, I love it. Um, So Helm, everybody, it's a great acronym. And I'm an acronym guy uh, (laughs) because I do have these senior moments where I walk around and I'm like, hey, where where is that? Um, So these acronyms definitely help keep it in perspective. Um, I want to shift. So we have a quick fire round. So real uh, spontaneous, just right off the top of the brain. Um, Mm -hmm. Favorite podcast that you are listening to right now? Aside from yours. Uh, Obviously. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) Um, that's a good one. What do I like? I love Joe Dispenza. I've been listening to a bunch of his stuff lately. Okay. Um, favorite professional inspiration? Uh, things I like to do. I don't know what that means. Uh, it could be a person, could be a moment in time, but just something that you look up to professionally to inspire you. Oh, I, pretty much every single one of my clients, when they come in and are so vulnerable with me and within a session, they can see things differently and they can apply stuff and they just have changed their lives. That might be the best answer we've had so far. Um, favorite book? Um, a Prayer for Owen Meany would be a novel. And um, you know what book I love that no one knows about? It's called 59 Seconds. Huh? You ever heard of that one? I have not heard of it. It's, it's, um, I haven't read it in a while, but I love it. It's, it's basic. It's a horrible, it's a horrible title. Uh, it's think a little change a lot. It's, it's research and scientific, um, um, information that we don't necessarily know about, but it, it's it's really it's really interesting. And each chapter is supposed to take fifty nine seconds to have you have a, a new idea and a new wisdom. Okay, all right. Um, well, Easy to I change like- the title, but it's a great book. <laughs> um, early riser or burning the midnight oil? Oh, I am annoyingly happy in the morning. Okay. <laughs> yeah, like I, I jump I, out of bed without an alarm with a smile on. Uh, so I'm not quite you, but I set my alarm early enough that by the time others are waking up, I've already moved past it. So um, and favorite pizza. Last question. Uh, mushroom. OK. Uh, I don't know why I feel guilty saying that. It should be something more gluttonous. But that is that is what I love. Uh, With the artichokes. If I'm going to mod pizza, the artichokes are going on, too. OK. All right. Uh, well, I won't hold the mushrooms against you, but uh, <laughs> Feels like the perfect way to ruin a pizza, but everybody's got their own preference. Um, I want to talk about the business that you've built. Um, Mm -hmm. So obviously you talked about you kind of had the traditional practice and then you started realizing like, hey, like there's tools, there's things that I can do to help people kind of at scale. So I want to go back to that moment as you were thinking about the business and you're starting, you put Mitzi in the corner and you started to put the building blocks together. What was the growth strategy when you were first starting coming out of the gate? Well, so it depends which business. So my, I have a coaching and speaking business, kind of a thought leadership business. And then over the pandemic, I opened a new business called Elevive. 
Elevate Your Mindset, Thrive in Life, and it's for teens and parents of teens. So um, I used to be a physical therapist and psychologist. So I've always had a practice where I did sports psychology, and this was really opening up, um, opening up more to to, uh, to all teens. Okay. So I'll, I'll go with that because I feel like the other business started so long ago. And again, it was kind of in the prehistoric ages before anything was happening. Um, so for this one, it's been really interesting because uh, first of all, there aren't a lot of people out there. So a lot of word of mouth and just having conversations with people. Um, but we are, I'm, I'm used to being very national and global. So, you know, the TV shows I'm on or the Today Show on Good Morning America and, you know, kind of national. And now this, this business is very local. And so we're doing more marketing and advertising, like real advertising. I actually bought advertising in magazines, okay. not, not online, but in magazines yeah. um, to really focus on the, um, the, the geographic area where, where I live. Okay. So that's been a really different approach than what I was doing before, which was a lot more global um, as a speaker, you know, getting in with speakers bureaus and, and kind of traveling around the, well, around the globe, really. So let's talk about the business a little bit more. You said it's for focus on teenagers and parents, like dig into a little bit. What, what exactly is the business offering? So, um, yeah, so it is mind skills training for okay. adolescents and their parents. What we say to ourselves impacts every single facet of our lives. Yeah. When we look at what predicts success Later in life, it's things like growth mindset. It's things like optimism. It's things like hope. It's things like emotional intelligence. And yet in school, when do we ever learn these things, right? Yeah. How do, when do we learn how to cultivate healthy self-confidence or how to get out and stay out of the red zone? And yet these are the biggest predictors of success, regardless of how you define success. It may be financially. It may be um, emotionally feeling happy. It may be relationships. It's these non-tangibles kind of yeah. that um that really predict success and they are skills just like just like playing the piano so my grandmother um used to teach she was a psychiatric nurse a little a little kooky like most of us in the mental health but she also was an incredible piano player and she taught a course called how to play the piano despite years of practice <laughs> how to play the piano despite years of practice so she would get rid of the skills that people had the bad habits, she would teach them the right skills and then they would practice them. And if you get rid of what doesn't work, mm -hmm. you learn what does work and you practice it. It doesn't matter what the skill is. You can't help it get better. So that's what I do with my teens and frankly, my parents are teens because the parents have never had these skills of how to think more rationally, how to make your mind work for you instead of against you. And again, it started in, um, in uh, uh, sports psychology because my athletes would come and they'd you know, they, I don't know, they're a golfer, missed a putt, and then it got in their head. And then they they yeah. just couldn't get out of that. They just got in that rut. And then it, it it's opened up to all, to, anyone really, but teens and parents of teens specifically to help them optimize their mindset so that they can really create the life that they want. Okay. Uh, well, that's very cool. I'm, uh, I'm inspired. And I think that that's a, a great thing. I think one of the Successful people that I was able to befriend, uh, college World Series winning pitcher, um, and I hanging out with them at the beach for a weekend with a group of friends, and I was just very curious about the psychology. Like, hey, how did how do you think you became so good? And his uncle was a professional baseball player, and so he grew up mm -hmm. in a very positive, a very professional environment where people were doing things that the rest of us, you know, thought were these superpowers. And really, it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of refinement. And he he's three years old. Right. And, and that's his environment. And so that became normal. But I think what's normal for most of us is not that. So I think that that's what's an incredible normal for lesson. most of us is parents being in the red zone yeah. and not realizing how their uh, interactions are impacting their children. And so it, it's generational. So right. my goal very simply is to change the world. And one of the ways that I want to do that is to change this generation, because yeah. when this generation changes, guess what? They're going to grow up, become parents. They're going to be able to pass it on to their kids, pass it on to their kids, pass it on to their kids. Very cool. Um, so you talked about speaking, uh, which is not natural for you. Uh, I've heard about some of your shyness and, you know, kind of that inner reclusiveness, Mitzi poking her head up. Yes. Um, talk to me about, you know, you didn't mention the trainings. Like, talk to me about this, A, it sounds like maybe you had the desire, but we're lacking the confidence. But then talk to me through the process of you are now, you are on TV, you are traveling internationally. Like, what was that process like for you? 
you know, I think it was, we all have certain things inside of us that if we admitted to others, you know, these goals, these dreams, wouldn't it be cool if, and I remember watching the Today Show and there was a psychiatrist, I'm a psychologist, not a psychiatrist, but we kind of do similar things sort of. And she was, she was speaking and I thought, not in an arrogant way, but I thought I, I could say, I could say at least that, right? I I, I could offer some input yeah. and that was my, oh, but I would never, I could never do that, right? I, I would never tell anyone that. So I think for me and, 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 and hopefully in the viewers, you know, what is it that really like, if, if it could happen in your life would just excite the heck out of you yeah. and, and realize that when you say you can't do it, it's you who's saying you can't do it. I mean, when I was in, this was kind of unrelated, but when I was, I remember when I was going to into college, I thought I was going to be a medical doctor. And I had a friend who was going into psychology and I, I don't know why I thought this, but I thought, oh, being a psychologist would be the coolest thing, but I could never do that. Uh -huh. I don't know why. <laughs> so listen to what those inner dreams are and realize that the fear that you have, you can, you know, we can transform it from fear to excitement, yeah. sweaty palms, racing heart. That's being scared and anxious. Sweaty palms, racing heart. That's being excited, right? Think about being in love. Sweaty palms, racing heart. So, you know, even just reinterpreting those symptoms for me before I go on stage in front of, you know, five, 10,000 or even, you know, 500, you know, you, you, you get excited. But if you reinterpret that as excitement as opposed to fear and so I'm going to mess up. That's one thing that really has been helpful to me. The other thing that's been really helpful to me is um, I was so focused on me. <laughs> It was, thought it was all about me, right? Oh, I don't want to look stupid. I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to mess up. And yet when I changed my focus from me to the audience, to the message, everything changes. So example, I'm on the Today Show. It was, I don't know, let's say 7 million pairs of eyes literally watching me. Yeah. I remember it was a segment on forgiveness. They had reached out to me. They were doing this week-long segment. What's one thing you can do to change? And it was health by the way, it was burpee was the answer to that. Mine was relationships. They said, what's one thing you can do that will change your relationship for the positive? And without hesitation, I said, forgiveness. Forgiveness is such a powerful thing. And we could have a whole, an hour podcast. We could have a, a days on forgiveness. But anyway, so I said this, um, went on the show, came back. I live in Chicago, came back the same day. So I'm wearing the same outfit. It's not like people are recognizing me at the airport, but I did have the same outfit on. And these two women came up to me and they said that they had watched the segment and one literally has tears in her eyes talking about how, you know, that what I said really resonated with her and how she had already re picked up the phone and called someone about, are you kidding me? Like, that right. is the coolest thing I've ever heard. That to me is worth way more than, you know, $3 million that I might be getting. Yeah. But again, focusing on your why, why are you doing what you're doing and really placing your energy on that as opposed to the what if something could go wrong? We want to think about what if something could go wrong, but we don't want to emotionally be there. Sure. We want to really focus on what we want to create and taking the steps to go forward. Okay. Um, well, cool experience. I mean, it's great to know that your message is having a very profound impact. Um, talk to me just about, like, as I do research for each guest, you were definitely in the like top 10% at least of having copious amounts of content because you've got a very strong PR game. Um, I imagine this is the cultivation of many years of, of activity. How did you first get going in the PR space to start building this momentum? So again, archaic times, right? This is before the internet. Um, I decided I wanted to be on the Today Show. That was it. In my mind, once I was on the Today Show, oh, life, everything would be different. So I, learned you don't actually pitch. Um, I didn't have, I didn't have money for a PR agent. So yeah. I learned you did. I thought I was supposed to pitch like Katie Couric, but you don't pitch the on-air talent, you pitch producers. So I would yeah. find a name of a producer and I would pitch the producer. Two years I did this. Two years I pitched different producers. Most of the time I never heard anything back from them, yeah. but I just, I knew in my heart, this was what I was supposed to be doing. So I just kept going and kept going, kept going. I kept learning how to pitch better. I kept focusing. Um, now it's so much easier because, you you know, nothing wrong with being on the Today Show, but that's not really what's going to change it. It's really about social media uh, media, and, 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 you know, doing podcasts and, and that kind of thing to be getting this message out there. Uh, but it really was about, again, focusing on my why and not giving up and, you know, even even for two years, it took two years. And then I got an email 
from the Today Show saying, um, you know, we'd like to talk about a segment. It was called Happiness Hangovers. And I remember I received the email on a Tuesday and we were moving on the following Monday from Pennsylvania to here in Chicago. And I was closing my practice because, of course, I had opened another practice and I, you know, I had all this stuff going on. And, and she said, um, can you be here Friday? Absolutely. Absolutely. Can you talk about this? Absolutely. Um, so it was very much perseverance, focusing on your why and being open to, you know, it, things aren't going to go as you expect them to, yeah. but being able to be flexible, if it's going in the right direction, just celebrate that. Where does the faith come from? I mean, two years is a long time and it's not like you didn't make any headway or make any traction, but where did that internal faith know like, hey, this is my mission. That's a long time to, to gut it out. I've never been asked that question. I, I don't. I just. I think when we listen to our true selves, mm -hmm. when we can turn off that inner critic and listen to what do I really want, mm -hmm. it takes time, right? right? Life can take time, and 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 you know, we 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 don't know the path. If if we want to get, if if I want to go from Chicago to New York, I could take a train, I could walk, I could take a bicycle, I could fly, and even if I flew, there's so many different paths. So yeah. I think for me, realizing, you know. It, my belief system is if if you really if something feels really strong within you, it's supposed to happen or something better supposed to happen. I'm a bit of an optimist. Um, and so I think I think, you know, just just keeping that in mind. I mean, was every every day did I jump out of bed like I'm doing great? No, of course not. I mean, I was beating myself up a lot, too. Um, but just to, to keep staying on that path and knowing I mean, I, I truly believe that things happen for a reason, which I know sounds, you know, get out the violins. And and I'll, I want to share, if I can, I don't know if we have yeah. time. I just want to share my, a story really quickly. It's not really a story, but it's it's my story. Um, sometimes people look at me and they're like, well, of course she's happy. You know, look at her success. Look at everything that's going on. Um, what some people don't realize, and I have started talking about this, is uh, seven years ago, the love of my life, my husband, we've been together for over half my life, um, was diagnosed with ALS, mm -hmm. Lou Gehrig's disease. Yeah. For the past five and a half years, he has been on a ventilator, trached, feeding tube. He is completely paralyzed. He's nonverbal. He requires 24-7 care. He's, he's in my house. Mm -hmm. I'm his primary caregiver. I say this because I don't want people to think, well, of course she's happy and she has all this you know, energy because her life's so great it's a, to say it's a challenge would be a complete, you know, understatement. understatement yeah. I, I share this because regardless of, and, and are there times I get in the red zone? Of course. Are there times it's not, it's coming out of my nose. I'm crying so hard because the love of my life, you know, the fact that he's still alive is a miracle and he could die any day. Of course. But even when we have tough situations, it really is where we focus our our energy and our and our and our mindset. And so I just encourage everyone out there, you know, whatever's happening in your business, whatever ha is happening in your personal life, you can make positive changes. In psychology, we talk about problem focused versus emotion focused. Problem focused is change the problem. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we can do that. We spent two years after the Mayo Clinic told me to take my husband home to prepare. That was literally the treatment they gave me, take him home to prepare. Right. We spent over two years finding every treatment out there and trying more treatments than you can imagine. Sure. Problem focused. Then he became completely paralyzed and on a ventilator. We weren't necessarily going to change the trajectory of his yeah. illness, but we could change our emotional reaction to it. And when we address our emotional reaction, that's getting out of the red zone. And once we're out of the red zone, then we can start to say, okay, what can we do? What can we do? What can we do? And so I really put that out there to anyone out there who's struggling because so many people are right now. Things aren't going to go as we planned necessarily, yeah. but ask yourself, what can I do and what's going well right now? And if you can ask those two questions and keep focusing on that as you're moving forward, then these bumps in the road are, are just going to be bumps in the road. Well, I'm sorry to hear. Um, it's definitely a, a very challenging uh, diagnosis, but I think what you've just shared, uh, I know it helps me. Um, my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer this year. Mm -hmm. um, Thank God, very happy, like everything is wonderful. Um, but that perspective, I don't think we've been closer or we've been more grounded. Like, I mean, it just, yeah, I mean, I'm almost crying. Um, so I, I think that that's awesome. And I think that that's a great place that we we finish here with the audience. It's it's your perspective and, and what you do with it because life is going to throw curveballs and it's up to us to figure out how we're going to deal with those curveballs. Yeah. So, um, 
thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I did, we did run out of time, so we will have to have you back at some point. No. Um, but this has been awesome. Uh, I really appreciate it. It's one of the most heartfelt ones that we've had. And so um, I can't thank you enough, Dr. E. I really, really appreciate it. Well, thank you. I, I really appreciate it too. What a really moving and inspiring interview we had with Dr. E today. I hope you got a lot out of it. Out of all of the ones that I've done, this is definitely in the top of my list as far as being able to influence and help improve my quality of life, both professionally and personally. If you like what you hear, please hit the like button. Definitely subscribe so you'll automatically be notified when our next episode drops. Until then, keep propelling your business forward.